Andre, you are a qualified physio and you have competed in both bodybuilding and powerlifting. So lots of experience. Andre is going to give us some useful tips around exercises for longevity of the shoulders. Sean, yes, thanks. I just want to emphasize as an ex-competitive powerlifter and bodybuilder, that's been a number of years ago that I stopped competing. But yes, I have competed and you are right, I am a physiotherapist. So I have uh, obviously experienced injuries in training myself as a competitor. And I've also worked with uh, clients who um, sustained some injuries. I think that's where the issue lies with training. It is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, we all know what the benefits of exercise are. Uh, there's, there's no doubt around that. But the downside is that with sport, there's also a lot of wear and tear on the old body, on the joints, especially with heavy loads, high repetitions over a long period of time. And if added into the mix, the exercises are performed poorly, incorrectly, or high-risk exercises are being performed over a number of years or decades, it can lead to injury. Sooner or later, but the injuries will come. And it is a bit of a passion of mine to be more proactive since I've been both on the receiving end and I've also experienced it as a therapist uh, it has become a passion of mine. We call that prehab or preventative exercise. And I hope we can share a few ideas and a few tips with our viewers. Some of it may be controversial. There may be other views out there. But these are the things that I've experienced and that I like to share with, with my client base. So if we look today at the shoulder joint, the shoulder joint, uh, its medical name is the glenohumeral joint. Uh, we can do a later video where we can actually look more at the anatomy and the detail. We'll leave the conversation at a bit of a higher level this morning. Suffice it to say, the shoulder joint is the most, one of the most mobile joints in the human body. It's got a lot of degrees of freedom. We can move it in various planes, above the head, behind the back, so it's a mobile joint. Because it's mobile, it is susceptible to injury and shoulder injuries are very common among strength athletes and athletes in general. And it's because the joint is so mobile and it's also a very complex uh, anatomical structure. Uh, at a high level again, it's comprised of a uh, few major muscles. The deltoid has got three heads, the anterior or the front head, the medial or lateral head, and then the posterior or the back head, giving you the entire shoulder uh, cap here. Uh, those are the muscles most commonly known. There is a less well-known muscle called the rotator cuff. Unfortunately, many people only uh, realize that there's a muscle called the rotator cuff once they tore the ro rotator cuff and that's a bit too late. The rotator cuff is probably one of the most important muscles in the shoulder. It is a stabilizing muscle and because the shoulder is so mobile the rotator cuff actually tries to keep the joint together during heavy exercise. It stabilizes the joint and we can later again go into more details. It's actually four muscles and they form a tendon called the rotator cuff tendon. Maybe the viewers has often heard about the condition called shoulder impingement or rotator cuff impingement. What typically happens there is that you've got your humerus, your arm bone, and you've got the shoulder bone, let's call it that. The side of that bone is called the acromion. And if we can visualize that you've got your humerus head and above it, you've got the acromion. Uh, so it's two bony structures. This rotator cuff tendon comes from the posterior from behind and it attaches on the humerus head. And so you've got bone, soft tissue and bone. And it is obvious that the tendon can become entrapped between the two bony surfaces. It can be uh, grinded down, uh, which causes inflammation and whatnot. 
We call that space the subacromial space. It's a space between the acromion, so you've got a ceiling and you've got the floor, and in between you've got that tendon. And that is a very common injury in sport, is a rotator cuff impingement. Often presents with anterior lateral shoulder pain, also pain here on the back, um, and then inflammation. And, and uh, uh, unfortunately, if that tendon uh, is completely ruptured, it is major surgery that will put you out of training for at least a year. Uh, it's a very dangerous uh, uh, injury and one wants to prevent that from happening. Now, the one thing I would say that if your coach does not include rotator cuff strengthening in your training routine, you must fire him or her and find yourself another coach because that is a staple of shoulder training. And I may quickly just show what internal external rotation actually means. So I've got my adjustable pulley set up here. On the cable pulley machine, let me just demonstrate what an internal and external rotation movement would be if I keep my elbow tucked in here and I do this. This motion is an external rotation. The humerus is turning, it's an external, and that's the rotator cuff predominantly that does that. Right, if I use my right hand and I start from the outside and I bring my arm in towards my body, that would be an internal rotation. If you think in arm wrestling terms, internal rotation, external rotation. As opposed to the hand hanging down, and we call this supination. This is just a rotation where the two bones in the forearm, uh, the radius and the ulna, they are sliding across each other like this. This is supination, pronation, as opposed to internal and external rotation. Right. So coming back to it, as part of a shoulder routine, what one wants to achieve with a shoulder routine is to have balance development. One wants to train all sections of the del deltoid. You do not want an overdeveloped anterior portion with a lesser developed side delt and rear delt. In most cases, people would have a very well developed anterior deltoid because of all the pressing movements, bench press, incline bench press, push-ups, any pushing movement will also involve the anterior delt. They will have maybe slightly weaker developed lateral delts or medial delts. They can be specifically trained, but in most cases the rear delt is often very neglected, the posterior deltoid. And you need that firstly to have a rounded shoulder and secondly it keeps the shoulder joint in the right position so that the joint is not into internal rotation. You often see people in the gym, if you look at them, if they're in the relaxed position, the thumbs are turned internally, they are in internal rotation, meaning all the anterior muscles pull the shoulder joint into interior rotation, and that means that the rear musculature is not properly developed, especially the rear guard. And then added to that, you need to develop your rotator cuff, and that would include resistance work, internal external rotation. People who do not have access to <coughs> an adjustable pulley setup like this, one can easily perform the exercise with a dumbbell. So if you just lie down on your side, yes, elbow tucked in, and at a 90 degree angle here with the elbow, and then if you elevate, you will feel it, the tension there at the back, up actually as high as you can. See, you need to develop this muscle a bit. Yeah, and that one would typically do again for a bit of a high repetition, maybe 15, 12 to 15 repetitions for maybe three sets. And you do that both left and right for your external rotation. Right. One can also perform this exercise using resistance bands, obviously. So the other way to do it would obviously be to attach a resistance band somewhere. Um, appropriately and then you could do the same here with the resistance band you could do this right your internal and external rotation so that is a very effective way to do it as well so Sean we've now looked at the general structure of the shoulder achieving balance development of the shoulder most importantly rotator cuff and to include rotator cuff strengthening as part of your routine we initially said that exercise is a double-edged sword 
we all know about the benefits. The downside is that over many years of training, heavy lifting, repetitive exercise, there's wear and tear on the joints. We can just have a look around us at how many competitive athletes, especially bodybuilders and powerlifters, in their 40s and 50s have tremendous challenges with joints, joint injury, mobility. Um, um, it's, it's, it's not a good sight out there to see. And that is unfortunately the downside and the result of long training over a long period of time, maybe incorrectly. So we need to try and mitigate that. Then our objective should be longevity, whether you're competitive or whether it's recreational. We want to be able to train for as long as possible, as safely as possible, well into our old age, 50s, 60s, 70s, and hopefully beyond. The latest research is very clear that maintaining muscle mass and muscle strength are two critical components of longevity. Uh, it really has got a big effect. We can just, if we think about it, you can maintain your independence for much longer. You're not dependent on other people, but most importantly, it definitely determines a lot of, around your longevity if you can maintain those uh, the health uh, criteria, um, uh, your strength and your your muscle mass. That is that is critical. So that said. We now need to look at how can we protect our joints, in this case specifically our shoulder joint. So the one thing before we look at specific exercises, if we look at the structure again of the shoulder joint, the joint does not sit in a 90 degree angle. It's not, it's actually slightly positioned anteriorly, maybe about 30 degrees. That's the angle of the joint. So if we keep on performing our exercises, with our elbows flared to the sides in a 90 degree, it's already not the normal position of the joint. The normal position of the joint is slightly forward. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. So any exercise that will push us into a 90 degree flared position, added heavy load, will increase the risk of extra wear and tear, but specifically it can compromise the rotator cuff and it can lead to shoulder impingement. There's no doubt, it is higher risk. So let's take, for example, here a look at the lat pull down. So here's the conventional lat pull down. Well, I have been taught when I started our training to do the pull down as a lat pull down behind the neck. Yeah. Now, if we look at that position, we can clearly see that the shoulders are flared and the shoulders pushed into that uncomfortable position. We can still get the benefit of this exercise just by modifying it to do the lat pull down to the front of the chest. I can still feel it in my lats, but the elbows are slightly forward and there is definitely less stress on the joint. So this would be my first training tip for longevity, for shoulder health, would be to do the lat pull down anteriorly in front of the chest and not the pull behind the neck. Right, that is the lat pull down. Sean, the other old favorite is the press behind neck. Again, that was something that was hammered into me. We even had a specialized press behind neck bench. And obviously, if we look at the exercise again from here, Again, our shoulders are flared out into that unnatural joint position. And then from there, you press the bar up. Again, if you look at the type of weight that people typically can push overhead, it can become very hefty. So that stress in that abnormal position for many repetitions over many years can definitely lead to joint issues. There's no doubt. So again, we can just modify the press behind neck to do an anterior press. You can still do the overhead press, but try and keep the elbows a bit to the front and again, a little bit angled out and from there, the push up. So still an overhead press, but slightly angled to the front. That would be my tip for the, the press behind neck to ditch the press behind neck in favor of 
the breast, the anterior breast. All right, so Sean, the next one is our other bread and butter exercise uh, for the chest, and that's the bench press. But as previously mentioned, the bench press also involves a lot of the anterior deltoid. It's also a shoulder uh, exercise. So again here with the bench press, seeing that it's done so often in a routine, it's the bread and butter. You do it a lot of times over many years, repetitions are high, again a lot of strain on the shoulder. The modification that I'm going to try and demonstrate here is actually fairly easy. We again do not want flaring of the elbows to the ears if we're in the bench position, which I'll show just now. We want to keep the elbows slightly more tucked to the torso, again keeping the shoulder at that angle. The flared position is, is the dangerous one. So let's have a look at it. If I move over here to the bench. Right. Here we've got our Olympic bar. And the typical bench that one would see would be going down to the chest, but flaring the elbows out to the ears, away from the torso. Here again, the shoulder is in a compromised position. It is a bit higher risk if we do this. I much rather prefer to do this, to keep the elbows tucked in a bit more, elbows closer to the torso, and then from there up. Typically, power lifters also would bench press with the elbows closer to the body. I'm not saying it should be completely against the torso, then it's a lot more triceps involvement, but certainly with the elbows at a bit of an angle and not flared to the ears. That would be my proposal for the bench press. Sean, another favorite upper body exercise is the old upright row, where the bar is grasped at a bit of a narrower grip, and then it's typically pulled up here and the shoulders up. Again, it is not a very comfortable position for the shoulder. It puts it potentially in a more compromised position for impingement. And this is the one exercise that I would ditch completely. I think it belongs in the graveyard of exercises. There are other better ways of exercising the shoulders. And I would say the risk for me is too high with this exercise. Again, not in the short term, long term potential issue. So ditch the upright row. So Sean, the other favorite shoulder exercise is the dumbbell side lateral. Uh, and it's an, an excellent exercise for developing the medial head. You can obviously perform it in many ways, one with dumbbells or again with a cable machine, the cable side lateral, which is one that I am really keen and fond of. But the dumbbell version we're going to have a look at. Again, I know there's going to be many opinions around this, but typically, we perform the side lateral uh, in a 90 degree angle, straight to the side. So that's the first thing we've been taught, is to lift it from the sides, up 90 degrees, and down. Right, again, not the absolute ideal, since we said the shoulder joint is sitting actually at a slight angle to the front. So again, lifting the weight straight to the side, is a bit of a, an issue because it's not the natural position of the joint. So again, I'll show it now. My suggestion would be to still perform the exercise, but with the arms move slightly forward to give that shoulder again that slight angle. That would be the first step. Secondly, again, I've been taught and I think most of have been taught to get maximum uh, stress on the medial delt. If we get to the top, we were told to pull the picture of water, to actually turn like that, to get maximal stress. Now, if we look at that motion, that is typically an internal rotation motion that we spoke about earlier. So you're lifting heavy weight straight to the side, not the way the joint has been designed. And then on top of it, you are doing an internal rotation. Your chance of entrapping 
the tendon the rotator cuff tendon is excellent over time you can have a problem so i'm completely against pouring the picture and doing that in fact it would be much safer if you have your thumb to the ceiling in external rotation it's a much safer option i must um, uh, uh, admit that doing the side lateral straight to the side and pouring the picture does place maximal stress on the on the on the medial delt there's no doubt i'm not arguing that but whether it is the safest so i'll rather compromise in having slightly less stress on the medial delt but doing it in a safer uh, safer range so if we do it it's the same delt and i'm not going to do the the twisting of the hand or the arm I'm just going to do it in a neutral position. So again, the side lateral, but there you see slightly to the front and not completely to the side. And it can even be with a less slightly, a slighter angle. The more you do it to the front, obviously the more front delt involvement. So if you do it straight to the front, a front raise, it is mostly anterior delt, slight medial delt involvement. So that's also true. That will be some criticism would be less taking stress off if you do that and involving more of the anterior delt all is true but you will still get sufficient stress on the medial delt doing it like that but it is safer so that would be my suggestion do it with a slight angle to the front and refrain from pouring the picture like we've all been told you can read many of the popular bodybuilding books some of the greats all advised us to do that i don't think it's the most clever thing to do that we might tip for side out. Andre, thank you very much for those tips. Definitely something I'm going to incorporate into my workout routine. I hope the viewers have also benefited from this. If you really enjoyed this, you can comment, leave your thoughts. We'll look forward to looking at those comments. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the opportunity. Again, this is a passion of mine. Uh, this is from my own experience. I'm more than open to other views. There are many ways to skin a cat, but I really think this is common sense. It makes a lot of sense to me. There are many influences out there who actually say the same thing. Um, and I really think that making some of these minor adjustments can actually prolong your exercise longevity. Again, which is ultimately our goal. Um, and then again some exercises I think the risk is too high. There is in my view nothing like a bad exercise. All exercises have got value but it is the risk benefit analysis that one must do. The risk of getting injured against the benefit you're going to get from that exercise and if the risk becomes a bit too high either do a modification or look at another exercise which will allow you to achieve the same objective but with lower risk. That would be my message. Thanks a lot and uh, thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching. Till next time, think, think muscles. muscles.